Welcome everyone to JSA TV, where we shine the spotlight on the leaders shaping the digital infrastructure industry. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okataya, CEO and founder of JSA. And I'm so excited to be joined today by none other than Mr. Doug Adams, CEO and president of NTT Global Data Centers. Doug, welcome to JSA TV. Hi, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me on your, your uh, podcast. Appreciate it. Nice to see you. It's been a while since uh, we've actually seen each other in person. Yeah, yeah. It's been too long, my friend. So let's go ahead and jump right in and catch up uh, in real time here. Absolutely. All right. All right. So it is a crazy time in our industry. We know that data center operators are being asked, well, the near impossible, keep up with insatiable, never before seen demand, while also mitigating impact on the grid. As the third largest data center provider in the world, so no small title there, what's NTT Global Data Centers, how, how do you take on this conundrum? That, that, is, that is the question. You're 100% right. I, in my 25 years of doing this, I have never seen the unprecedented demand that we're dealing with right now. I remember a year and a half ago when AI really started to take off and, and you started to see it hit the press, the CAGRs for our industry projection moved from 13.5% growth, which was incredibly difficult to keep up with, to over 23%. I've seen up to 25% projections by some analysts. It is unbelievable, the landslide of growth that's happening in our industry. And we at, at, at GDC have seen a 50% increase alone in our growth. Uh, it's been extremely difficult. It's taxing on the team. It's taxing on, on the business to, to have that level of strain. The good news is we have an amazing team and we have an amazing portfolio of properties. And I think that's the, the really the big plus is that we came into this with some fantastic assets and a, a very strong bank of, of land that we had land banked. Because um, right now it's almost impossible to find land that has power. So we have a complete team that's doing nothing but scouring the earth, looking for pieces of property that have uh, power that can be accessible over the next couple of years. And then the other side of that is, once you find the land, once you permit it, entitled, you're ready to construct, is, is the, the power. It's, it is nearly impossible to get. And, and frankly, some of the things that we're doing in our industry, things like liquid to the chip, are actually making that better and easier. And, and what I mean by that is liquid to the chip is much more efficient than air-cooled. Traditional air-cooled, um, the thermodynamics of using air to dissipate the heat is much different than using liquid. Liquid is much more efficient. So we're seeing gains of about 5% by using the liquid cooling, which I realize doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking about a 36 megawatt building, that's one and a half megawatts of incremental load that, that comes off the grid because of that savings by using liquid to the chip. So huge, incredible change in that industry, super, super dynamic. Yeah, and of course, within our industry, another topic we talk about almost as much as power and uh, liquid chip is collaboration. And, you know, I read recently about NTT's collaborative approach of working with government leaders and energy providers to really establish realistic forward-thinking standards. Can you give us a little bit more information about that? Sure. So, so when you're using as much power as we are globally, um, it's incumbent on us to, to work with all of the local uh, municipal providers in the different geographies we operate in. And we, we are literally a global player. So we have hundreds of megawatts uh, installed and running and, and hundreds of megawatts coming online within Europe, Asia, EMEA, um, the US. And so we've done quite a bit of very tight collaboration. I'll give you just a, a couple of examples. So uh, working with, with uh, Gasag, which is the power municipality um, within Berlin, um, we actually are using our waste heat, and right now we're, we're using about 20% of that heat is used for uh, management of the Marion Park area for heat production. And 
we're going to get up to 80% of that. So in Europe, they're very forward thinking. They will capture the heat produced by factories and data centers and use that to um, heat homes. Um, and, and we right now, again, 20% headed to 80% just within that market alone. Um, in Minanova, uh, we are uh, using, which is, by the way, uh, outside Hattersham, um, we're also doing the same thing. And it's helping us decarbonize and con uh, contribute to that area's uh, cost savings as well as, as the environment. And so quite a few examples we have in Europe of using our excess uh, heat to power homes and to power parks and schools and things of that nature. Um, and as we move into the, the next phase of what I see the, the data center uh, market, which is really alternative fuel sources, alternative power sources, things like um, uh, SMRs, things of that nature, I think you're gonna see a, a huge push towards wow. decarbonization and ensuring that we are better stewards for the environment. Yeah, and we are equally as passionate here at JSA about talking about sustainability in, in our data center marketplace. Um, we have a Greener Data book series that we release every two years so folks can collaborate and learn more. Uh, so I, our, I want you to write another chapter in this book for us. Uh, <laughs> that on the side. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of renewable energy in powering data centers? You touched upon it, but can you give us a little bit more? Sure. Hey, again, another great question. So right now, about 51% of our portfolio is, is carbon neutral. Um, and we're uh, working with a plan to be completely carbon neutral by 2030. Um, yeah. And so it takes a lot. We have an entire team working on ensuring that we get there. Um, I think that you're going to see emergence of new types of technologies. Um, I go back to AI. And from my perspective, one of the exciting things about AI is once AI truly becomes sentient, it's thinking for itself, I think it's going to solve part of the grid problem that today you could argue it's potentially creating because AI is creating a, a lot of, of, of drain on the grid system globally. But, yeah. but AI, I think, is also the solution for that. So that's one solution, I'd say. Once AI is up and running, I think AI is going to find lots of different alternatives for how we, we create power. The one that we're most interested in right now, which just a couple of years ago, frankly, um, I'm not sure, I, th I think I would have dismissed if we talked about it a couple of years ago, is SMRs. Uh, I think you're seeing AWS and Google and Oracle embracing them. You're seeing press releases of them bringing old retired nuclear plants back online. You're seeing some of the more progressive users actually starting to deploy or have a pathway to using SMRs. Um, again, just a couple of years ago, I'm not sure I was a believer in that technology, but what we're seeing with the explosive growth in our industry, there has to be alternatives. And to me, one of the most promising is SMRs, because unlike wind farms and solar, which are diurnal, you have a 24 by 7 production. And by 2030, I think you're going to see the mainstream use of them within infrastructure. And I think you're going to see partnerships between data centers and power grids. I'm not sure that those SMRs are going to be sitting in the, the back of house or the, the, you know, the land that the data center actually sits on. But I think you're going to see power grids um, extending out to where the data centers are and building farms of SMRs next to the data centers. That, that's what I think you're going to see over the next few years. Yeah, I, I, I share your vision. I, I really think the future is hopeful um, yeah. with AI and, and technology allowing us to collaborate and be more innovative together. So last question, and this sort of uh, is, is a great transition here. What is your future? What does it look like, NTT Global Data Centers? What do you have in store for us for the rest of 2025 and beyond? I think you're going to see lots of growth and continued innovation. Mm. So right in, in uh, 2025, we're bringing on nine new facilities, a couple hundred megawatts of infrastructure. Um, like everybody in our industry, we're signing for complete buildings and for complete campuses before we ever put a shovel in the ground. And yeah. so these contracts we're building in 2025 were actually signed a year and two years ago. 
Um, we've done a tremendous job of land banking globally. We have, I believe, the only half a gigawatt campus within India that's actually started and up and running. You're seeing lots of press releases about people doing things in Hyderabad, different parts of, of, of India. We have a facility that we're on our third building that is a half a megawatt campus um, just outside of Mumbai that I think is, is going to be very promising for us because we're seeing a lot of growth within the India market. One of the advantages of being a global provider is we're able to provide our customers infrastructure anywhere in the world. And so I think you're going to see us doubling down and tripling down on our campuses within the U.S. Uh, we've got some really big, exciting two, 300 megawatt campuses uh, in Europe that we have purchased land for. Um, I think you're going to see explosive growth within the NTT portfolio for data centers because the senior global management NTT is putting an emphasis on this area of the business. They're extraordinarily supportive and the market demand is a strong tailwind just pushing the industry. So I'm excited. I'm super excited about what we've done. I'm excited about the team that we've built and their expertise because um, it's more than just the buildings. The buildings are, are really just, frankly, high-tech assets. Mm -hmm. The people that, that man those buildings, the people that design those buildings, the people that build those buildings, to me, are the most exciting part about the business. And I've spent the last five years kind of retooling NTT GDC. And a year and a half ago, when I became the global CEO, the first thing I did was take four disparate entities, move them to one entity, so that we have the ability for our customers to provide one contract for the globe. We get the kinds of scale uh, and the buying power for a global entity. It's all those kinds of things that allow us to, to really cash that check of being the, the third largest data center provider globally. And I'm excited. I'm very, very bullish about our future. Wow, I'm excited just listening to you. You're so inspirational. I feel like <laughs> If so many more data center operators could can listen to your words and uh, and take inspiration from you, because you're not only growing, which is incredible in itself, but you're growing sustainably, smartly, and with a team that that embraces uh, your vision and and uh, helps you grow together. So, uh, thank you, thank you for being such an inspiration for our industry. It has been so great to catch up with you, Doug. I really appreciate Pleasure your time. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. And I, I love what you're doing for our industry. Thank you for getting the word out there and evangelizing about the data center industry. Because from my perspective, it's the only place I would ever want to be. And I think it's a great place to be. And we have a great tailwind for the entire industry. So thank you, Jamie. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you also to our audience for tuning in to another episode of JSA TV. As always, happy networking. <laughs>